thank you all for joining us uh, this evening. I know that it's a cold night. Um, glad to have you all uh, participating and not having to go to uh, another building and trudge through uh, the cold to get here. So thank you for joining us um, virtually tonight. Um, this is the Landmark Design Guidelines Phase 1 meet community meeting that we're going to have, and um, we're, we'll get going. So Oops, sorry. Um, just wanted to to um, introduce ourselves. So uh, everyone on the Landmark team is here today and is going to be joining us um, for breakout rooms, but wanted to introduce myself and um, Jesse White and Brittany Bryant, who are going to be giving helping with the presentation today. Uh, the three of us will be the, the ones pre presenting, but there will be, uh, you'll see several other Landmark staff members um, in breakout rooms. So Rules of the game, um, we are uh, happy that you're here participating. We will call on people to ask questions. Um, we ask that you keep your questions brief and to um, allow everyone have a, to have a chance to speak. So preferably two minutes or less. Um, and we ask that you are respectful of all opinions and avoid obscenities and hurtful language. So if you have questions, please feel free to, to type those into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. You can also use the, the hand raise function um, at the bottom of your screen. And if you're joining by phone, you can and dial star nine to raise your hand. Um, we are recording the presentation and we are going to be adding that recording to our website so that you're aware of that. We are not recording the breakout rooms, um, but we will have a summary um, for, for everyone so that that part will be recorded. Um, also, just quickly about the, the chat, we will have people who are up will be answering um, the chat live and then also um, answering uh, questions as they come in um, via the chat. So keep an eye on that. Um, just to let you guys know how this whole structure is going to go, we uh, are dividing the design guideline update into four phases. So right now we're focusing on phase one, which is solar panels, retaining walls, and wall cladding materials. We also are going to be doing clarifications to um, landscaping, sheds, lighting, egress windows, and fencing. These are topics that we heard from you all, from members of the public, from um, applicants, from homeowners and property owners, and from the Landmark Preservation Commissioners that they had concerns about the most. And so um, we focused on those for phase one. We are uh, doing phases two through four, um, starting in later in 2022. Um, and these will be kind of rolling um, phases that will be adopted by the Landmark Preservation Commission. We originally had these in a slightly different order, but based on the feedback we got from you all during the um, kickoff meeting we had September 22nd, 29th, that we um, we shifted these around a little bit. So it was clear from that meeting and from the survey that we had on our website that additions and info were much more um, critical for us to address than um, ADUs and tandem houses and, and those kinds of things. So we switched things around a little bit. And we may continue to do that as we get more feedback from you all about that. All right, so um, tonight, the, the meeting structure is to talk specifically about solar panels, retaining walls, and wall cladding materials. We will be giving, um, staff will be giving a brief presentation on each topic. We will talk about the existing guidelines and then the other cities' guidelines that we've researched, um, as well as major topics to discuss. And then we're dividing you all up into breakout rooms. So um, those breakout rooms will be about 10 minutes each. There will be a landmark staff person uh, moderating each of those breakout rooms and asking you questions to kind of prompt the conversation. Um, there may be landmark preservation commissioners in breakout rooms as well, and they will be there in the listening capacity um, and to, to get your feedback. Uh, we ask that what e there be one person from each breakout room that summarize what was said in that breakout room. So we would like a volunteer for each breakout room to do so, um, to summarize for everyone at the end of um, that breakout room so that everyone can hear it. Because as I said, breakout rooms are not going to be recorded, but we will be recording the main, um, the main presentation, or we are recording the main presentation. So once we do that for solar panels, then we'll do it again for retaining walls where we'll have a brief staff presentation, breakout room, summary, and then again for cladding materials. And then towards the end of the meeting, we're going to uh, do a really brief presentation on the other guideline clarifications we're going to do, as well as next steps on phase one, and have time for a brief question and answer session um, before we wrap up around 730. So to give you an um, Background as well, we did some, we did a bunch of research and by we, I mean Taylor, our intern who um, did an immense amount of research for us on 
22 cities guidelines in 12 states. So here are the states that are that she researched, and um, here are the cities that were researched. So she looked at cities that were had comparable population size and similar architectural comparisons to Denver. So um, you can see the those listed on the left. Um, the year that is next to those is the year that those design guidelines were updated. We um, then broadened that out to uh, provide regional comparisons and to have cities that um, to look at cities that recently updated their design guidelines. So that was another um, large group of um, cities that Taylor researched. All right, so now we're going to talk about solar panels. We have 300 days of sunshine, or so they say, each year, and so solar is a is a big thing for our city. And um, so we wanted to take a look at whether our design guidelines um, are sufficient, or whether they should be more flexible or less flexible. Here's what our current design guidelines say. So, when installing solar collectors, minimize any adverse impact effects on the character um, of a of the property. Um, that means to put them in an unobtrusive location if possible. So secondary um, structures such as garages or ADUs are good ones to put them on. Um, put them below the ridge line of the roof, mount them flush with a minimum, um, uh, minimum um, visibility, and then um, make sure that they're subordinate in size and scale to the structure. Our guidelines also talk about that when you have a side um, a, a front facing gable or, or a side roof to put the solar collectors on the rear two thirds of the roof. Um, and that is uh, to really minimize visibility to follow all of these, um, these other guidelines that talk about the location, the, um, the profile, the exposed hardware, minimize adverse impacts on the historic roofing. We also have Denver building code requirements for solar. So there are requirements that say that um, that you must have two clear access walkways from the lowest side of the roof to the ridge. So that's here or here or here or over here. I minimize myself. Uh, there we go. Here or here. Um, so you need to have two of two access pathways, depending on um, where your solar collectors are installed. You also have to have clearance on either side of the roof ridge, and the size of that clearance depends on how many solar collectors you have on the roof. And then finally, if you have um, upper story egress requirements, you cannot put solar collectors that would obstruct the um, egress paths below that. So that is, um, sorry, I lost my mouse. Um, that is right here. That has to be a clear pathway right there. What did other cities say? So we say rear two thirds of the roof. Um, there really aren't specific setback requirements, but they most cities require minimum visibility from the street. So they want um, solar that is panels that are rear facing or that are side facing and are really very minimally visible if visible at all. Take a look at um, more specifically some cities. So there, one of the cities that has a very specific setback um, is New Orleans and they require a minimum of 10 feet from the street facing wall. So that would be a 10 foot setback from the front of the building. Um, Washington DC encourages installations on secondary elevations as well as San Antonio. They want people to put panels at the rear of the property. Um, Fort Collins has specific guidelines about um, individual landmarks. They don't have dimensions on their setback, but they say that a setback is required for individual landmarks, highly visible roofs, and um, if there are many intact historic buildings in the area. There are flexibilities on setback in some of these cities, depending on um, solar efficiency and solar access. So Fort Collins, for example, allows solar flexibility um, for solar access if it's a contributing or non-contributing building to a historic district, or if the roof is not highly visible and it's an individual landmark. San Antonio allows flexibility, Washington DC allows flexibility, but have requirements based on um, what the design should look like. And then design of panels. This comes up uh, fairly regularly in Landmark Preservation Commission meetings about whether, um, about the design of how these panels are installed on the roof. New Orleans requires a rectangular and contiguous arrangement, whereas DC requires compositionally balanced design, um, especially if the roof panels are visible. And then San Antonio requires that they're flush mounted, they're not a visual distraction, and um, if they're low profile and match the or similar color to the roofing material, then there could be greater flexibility there in location. So 
some things we would love for you guys to talk about and think about. Um, should there be different design guidelines for different roof forms? For example, if you have um, a hipped roof, uh, should it just be on the side? Should there be some allowed on the front? What about on a front facing gable so you only have a side elevation of the roof? What about um, a mansard roof like the one in the middle? Should solar be panels be allowed on the, on the mansard portion, um, not necessarily on the flat portion? Um, what about buildings that are interior to the block? Uh, or corner properties that have much more visibility? Uh, what about the, the design of the, um, the layout? So should they be symmetrical? Should be they grouped? Should be they, they be allowed to be random? What about roofing materials? Does it matter if um, they're on asphalt shingles versus metal roofing like standing seam metal? Or if they're on clay or concrete tiles? Um, what about visibility there? How about the significance of the building? Should there be different guidelines based on if they're individual landmarks or based on whether they're contributing buildings to a historic district, which means they're historic buildings um, and contribute to the history of the district or non-contributing buildings that don't uh, necessarily convey the history of the district. Um, and finally, solar tiles. So what about um, solar tiles that are integrated into all of the roofing tiles like these over here, or solar tiles that are integrated into non-solar roofing materials like asphalt shingles um, versus solar panels? Should we have different guidelines uh, associated with those? So we're gonna break you, do breakout rooms. Um, we're gonna break you up into groups. We'll have 10 minutes. Staff is going to moderate the conversations, as I said, and we'll give you a five minute warning and a two minute warning so that everyone's aware we can kind of keep track of the time. Um, and I'm not seeing it. So I think what we can do is just run through each breakout room. Um, would someone like to represent breakout room number one and share what you all discussed? Um, and we can take some notes, what no. those were. No, no, I don't want to. I don't know what breakout room anyone was in. Could you tell us maybe the- uh... A great question. I have no yeah, idea. I, say, I don't think we, we knew that. Yeah. Oh, I think we were, we were five. I know our room if you need us to start, I guess. All right, Crystal, you, you go for <laughs> we it. We were room seven, I looked. <laughs> so <Thank you. laughs> uh, I had Sue and Rosemary, two Ryans. Um, I'm sorry if I missed you. Uh, anyway, we uh, discussed the solar panels and um, there wasn't any like hard and fast ideas of anyone's, but I think everyone seemed to agree that we should allow more flexibility overall, um, because we all realize that solar panels obviously aren't historic, but seem appropriate and will be needed in the future for renewable energy sources. Um, I also had a comment that um, maybe we should just treat corner and interior properties the same and not have greater restrictions on corner properties. Um, but yeah, it was just like more flexibility overall, um, but still not all the way on the front. So that was kind of our summary, I'd say. If anyone in my room wants to add anything to that, feel free. I don't remember what room I was in either, but Shannon volunteered. Um, for our room, so I'll let her speak on our behalf. We're room two. Uh, so yes, we are room two, and our uh, our discussion really also focused on flexibility, um, flexibility on location, and also kind of looking at uh, buildings case by case, uh, because you know you in terms of um, delineating roof forms and saying that this roof form allows for this type of rules or regulations for panels creates um, less flexibility. And so um, looking at buildings case by case, it would allow for that flexibility when it comes to solar panels. Also looking, oh, our group was talking about the corner lots versus interior lots, and then also landmarks. Um, and if you would look at each of these differently, um, creating more flexibility or less flexibility for one over the other. And there was a consensus that, that by doing that, you would create less flexibility for say a corner lot versus an interior uh, within a district and uh, the same with landmarks. And so um, this idea of greater flexibility would uh, then 
not be the case if we created that kind of delineation between corner versus interior and landmarks. Uh, and then also solar tile, tiles we talked about, and that should definitely be allowed, um, maybe even more so than solar panels, because they do fit within the character of these buildings even more so, are a little bit more conspicuous, and um, could create more flexibility with and allow for more solar panels. So I think that was generally our, our main points. Great, thank you. And I don't know what breakout room we were in, but Ozzy uh, Friedrich took notes for us. So I'll allow him to unmute himself and, and share everyone's thoughts. Yeah, so our, our group started with a, a really interesting statement that solar is going to be the future, um, which I, I think is a really important thing to note. And you know, ultimately, I'd, we probably don't want to disadvantage historic neighborhoods by making it too hard to have solar. Um, uh, since that's going to be the norm for a lot of places. Um, uh, then the discussion was that there, there's lots of it depends uh, when we talk about these things, but the more flexibility is needed. Um, uh, it was thought that current guideline, the current guidelines make sense for individual landmarks, but not as much for districts where there are a lot of ordinary houses that could have solar without, like just lots of solar without being disruptive. Um, uh, I think there was a sense that the example of like current technology solar on front of mansards probably wouldn't be so great. Uh, and then I think there was a consensus that the Tesla roof tiles and the other rooftop products look pretty great, um, maybe better than asphalt shingles and, and why, why restrict those. So that was us. Great, thank you. All right, who's next? Gary, go for it. Um, nobody volunteered in our group, so Evan volunteered me. Um, uh, again, there was a conversation about wanting more flexibility um, relative to how visible the roof is. For example, in a neighborhood where two and a half story Queen Anne's are three feet apart, you might not see the panels from the street, even if they went all the way into the first third of the roof. So it's kind of a case by case basis. Um, um, there, was a, there was a comment made about older neighborhoods where there are a lot of taller uh, apartment buildings adjacent to older buildings. And while it's not a guideline issue, it's the issue of solar access being denied some people by other development. And that's not necessarily something that the guidelines will address but it is probably a city issue that should be looked at. Um, yes, uh, consideration for different roofing materials that solar panels on some roofs are more obtrusive than others. And again, um, should be looked at in a case by case basis, just how uh, character defining the existing roof is and how the installation of solar panels might affect that. Um, also, uh, we discussed, um, should more flexibility be granted to non-contributing buildings in a district than say contributing buildings and should individual landmarks have the most restrictive guidelines. So there was some sense that some differentiation makes sense, although that does raise equity issues um, in the broader picture. I think that uh, kind of sums it up. Great, thanks. So that's about half of our breakout rooms. We still have four more who would like to go next. We had Allie um, taking some good notes for us in our breakout group. Yeah, so we had a couple of discussions um, and Steve, I hope you'll jump in because I did miss one of your comments. Um, so we had a discussion about whether or not solar panels should be considered the same as other temporary additions. So for example, a swamp cooler, and we felt like that would potentially lend itself to additional flexibility given that solar panels can be removed. Um, and changed and do still at this point have a have a, um, a non-permanent lifespan. Um, there was a conversation about uh, that it, it certainly may not be preferable aesthetically, but solar panels even on the front of the house should that have historic areas or sort of living, breathing, modern, um, allow for modern living. Um, we also had the same conversation that sounds like some groups had had that um, 
solar tiles seem to be more aesthetically pleasing, that they allow, uh, don't seem to be quite as sort of disruptive to the eye. Um, and that there is also potentially an equity issue as it relates to solar tiles. They're significantly more expensive, um, but allow for a greater portion of the roof to be used for solar, which then sort of creates this unfortunate um, dynamic of if you have more money, you can save more money. Um, and so without some kind of subsidy, um, allowances for solar panels seems also relatively important. Um, and I think those were the primary concerns. We did talk about um, the difference on non-contributing roofs, and I'm sorry, that's where I didn't get all the notes down, Steve. So if you had wanted to- Just real quick, the, the question was, suppose there's a non-contributing, so to speak, addition to a contributing structure, and how do you figure out which roofs are eligible and so forth? Because um, there, there are probably a fair number of those in the city. Great point, yep. Okay, great. Who's next? We were I would love to volunteer group. Bruce from my group, uh, room one especially to talk about the idea of solar um, efficiency flexibility. Um, sure. So we talked not only about the historic nature that we're trying to protect, but also the need for uh, some flexibility for efficiency. Like if there's a tree or a, or a shade structure, someone mentioned an apartment building next to a house, you might need to move it to a different location than is currently allowed. So the flexibility might be considered in a way almost like a flowchart, an if-then statement. If there's something, then you're able to do something else um, so that there's a way to prioritize what you would like to see, but that it would allow some flexibility if that's not possible for efficiency. Um, and we also have to have a conversation about equity as well, that people who live in historic districts shouldn't be penalized necessarily to do the right thing. So how do we do that in a way that um, encourages the right behavior, but that, that, that um, also preserves what we're trying to preserve, bottom line. And I didn't share, the, but Breckenridge has a really complex structure of um, a preference system and it's kind of a if then then do this and this and you know that kind of thing so there are other cities that do that which is kind of interesting so. great Kara it sounded like you were going to jump in yeah we were room six um I know Patrick was taking some notes if he would like to speak um if not um I think Kelly and I were taking notes as well yeah thanks Kara I, I thought we were room six but I couldn't quite remember for sure but um, a lot of our discussion focused on kind of the need to defer to the individual landmark districts for a lot of these decisions in the end, because, you know, different roofing materials and shapes and architecture can vary widely between the districts and what's significant to them. Um, let me see here. Another issue that we know we went, we had some debate on actually was the the consideration for the longevity of the solar panels you know some of us thinking that you know solar panels could get greater flexibility because they're not necessarily long-term architectural modifications you know they, they can be removed but in practice you know it, it might be a little bit difficult to do that they're maybe not as easily removed as uh you might think um, but i think the overall theme was that you know, we could have greater flexibility in areas other than that immediate uh, street view. You know, could, there could be more consideration for uh, taller buildings that the roof is, you know, not really visible anyway, or maybe uh, other parts of the roof that are on a, a larger lot or a corner lot that would be less visible. So yeah, I think overall we supported some more flexibility. Great. All right, but I, I took notes for our team, um, but I think there's one more out there. Did everyone talk? Come and share. All right, then we'll share what our group, which was uh, room eight. I'm always gonna be part of room eight because as the host, I have to, <laughs> I have to find, I can't be assigned a room. Um, so anyway, uh, we, um, 
the discussion I'm looking over at my notes, the discussion was largely that um, the current guidelines are a good starting point, um, that there could be some more flexibility when it comes to um, homes on avenues that are street facing. So you have um, on the east west streets that um, where if you have a house that faces south and so you have a roof that is very visible on a um, south facing slope of a roof um, that maybe there could be more flexibility there but it really uh, it it depends on the design that um, as less disruptive as possible. So more rectangular, less um, staggered and stepped would be important. Um, definitely not having um, solar panels on mansards. Uh, there is a lot of concern about highly visible um, solar panels. So if you have a corner property or you have a lot of visibility over a shorter property, so you're maybe a two story and there's a one story next to you and there's a great amount of visibility that, that there was a strong feeling that that um, disrupts the historic character of the district. Um, and then um, if the roofing material is a character defining feature, so for example, a clay tile roof, then maybe there should be more restricted restrictions when it comes to solar panels on those because of the, the contrast and the um, change to a character defining feature. And finally, um, like many of you, uh, there was talk of solar tiles and how wonderful they are and um, supportive of those. So, all right. Well, thanks very much. I'm going to share. Uh, if anyone has anything else that they'd like to add, please feel free. Otherwise, we'll jump to retaining walls. All right, Jesse, I'm going to share the screen. Um, Jen, and just... we we did just have uh, Sveen had raised his hand. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see. Oh, Sveen, you'll have to sorry. unmute yourself. You're on mute. Maybe that was an accident. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, Very good. you're good. I just recommend from everything I heard, there's one word that seems to be pervasive, namely the word flexibility. And I recommend that the commission keeps that in mind. Sounds good, thank you. Absolutely. All right, great. I'm going to share PowerPoint and Jesse, take it away. I'm gonna go on mute, um, but let me know when you want me to change slides. Okay, um, so now we're gonna move into the next section and that is retaining walls. Um, so then this portion of the presentation, um, it will be broken down into two specific categories of concern. Um, the first category is uh, for materials. And then the second category has several items in it. So that includes height, uh, the Denver Hill, terracing, and landscape buffers between uh, the city sidewalk and the property. Can you hit the next slide? Our first category of concern is materials. Um, this is covered under our guidelines as the use of materials that are common to the district or relate to the historic property. Uh, in the past, the commission has allowed a handful of materials typically. Um, those include natural stone, brick, and stucco, as well as smooth, uh, smooth finished concrete in some cases. Uh, the commission has also seen several alternative proposals for materials, um, and we'd like to gauge your thoughts on that um, when we go into our breakout rooms. Um, so just keep that in mind whenever we're um, moving through this presentation. So before we move on, let's take a look at what some of the possible, uh, uh, excuse me, before we move on to see what some of the possible alternatives are, let's take a look at what other cities are doing. Um, so Breckenridge is talking uh, specifically that they want natural or native stone. Uh, Telluride looks at uh, native stone traditional uh, with traditional mortar. Uh, board form uh, or plain concrete is sometimes allowed. Um, and altern other alternatives may be allowed, but they must be contextual to, contextual to the district. And then El Paso is pretty simple. Uh, brick, stone, and stucco. So they're pretty similar to what uh, Denver allows. Um, they also have a list of unacceptable materials as well, but we'll just kind of uh, brush through that. So now we'll move on to the second category of concern, and that, can, that focuses predominantly on the Denver Hill and on wall height but it also includes terrace walls and landscape buffers between the city sidewalk and the property. 
Uh, so first, let's take a look at what our current guidelines say on these topics. And they state that applicants should preserve the character of the Dem Denver Hill and that retaining wall should be limited to one foot kick wall and that terracing should be avoided. And before we move on, um, I, I'd like to highlight what the Denver Zoning Code uh, uh, says about restrictions for um, um, retaining walls. And that is that um, the allowable height for retaining walls and, uh, is no more than four feet. And there can be no more than one foot in grade change of the front setback. So this is really important to know because we aren't going to be making any updates to the Denver Zoning Code um, as we're updating our guidelines. So whatever um, we decide uh, is appropriate to update our guidelines to, it will need to be um, within the parameters that are outlined in the Denver Zoning Code. So again, max height of four feet, and no, no more than one foot grade change in the front setback. Um, so let's look at what other cities are doing with these topics. Um, Breckenridge talks about maintaining the height of, of existing walls and not increasing the height. It doesn't really look like it covers um, new retaining walls, uh, although it does say if you do need additional security that you can put in a uh, wrought iron fence on top of the retaining wall. Telluride is a little more detailed when it comes to height. Um, they talk about minimizing the height of walls. Um, they talk about contouring, reducing the need for retaining walls, uh, limiting the heights to uh, less than 30 inches and not to exceed four feet in height, um, especially when adjacent to pedestrian paths. And that terracing of steeper hills is, is often encouraged. So a little bit different from what Denver is doing. Uh, so now that we've looked at what other cities are doing with retaining walls uh, materials, let's go over uh, and heights. Let's go over a few materials that uh, Landmark has seen proposed in recent years. Some of those materials include board form concrete, man-made landscaping blocks, gabion walls, um, man-made or excuse me, gabion walls and, and cordon steel, all of which are, are um, shown in the photos here. Staff do not want to limit your discussion about uh, the, the materials to just these four materials. We'd really like you to discuss any materials that you think might be appropriate here. Um, so what we would like you to consider it is what is an appropriate material and why is it an appropriate material? And uh, does quality, longevity, appearance, and context come into play when selecting those materials? And then finally, let's move on to our discussion points. Um, so in this section, we, we'd like to encourage you um, discuss, to have discussion around um, both of these areas of concern. I mentioned some questions to think about for materials. This is dealing most, mainly with the Denver Hill terracing and landscape buffers. Um, so some questions to keep in mind. Do you feel that a taller than 12 inch kick wall is appropriate for, front, uh, for uh, in front of a building? Would you be okay with a solid wall or would you prefer to see terracing? Um, do you think that it's important to preserve the Denver Hill? Um, or do you think that the Denver Hill can be altered or terraced? Um, do you think that landscape buffers between city sidewalks um, and retaining walls are important? Um, so just providing like shown here in this plan view, um, kind of that planting buffer between the city sidewalk. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> and the retaining wall just to kind of soften it? Um, or do you feel that there should, uh, excuse me, um, do you also feel that there should be different standards um, for properties in a district versus individual landmarks? Um, and then finally, are there any other areas of concerns for retaining walls that you think landmarks should address when updating the guidelines? Um, so really, we just want you um, to give us your feedback and thoughts on materials, heights, Denver Hill, whether terracing is appropriate and if a landscape buffer would also be appropriate. All right, we're going to go. Sending everyone into rooms. Thanks, Abby. All right, welcome back. Hope you all had good conversations. Our group was really interesting thoughts. Um, who would like to go first? Should we, Crystal, do you want to jump in first again? Sure, happy to. Uh, so we had a lot of good discussion. Uh, I will say I think the main 
the main point is that nobody likes the Denver Hill um, <laughs> or cares about it. So <laughs> I think that was a consensus that I heard. Um, a lot of people also seem supportive of Terracine as well, being okay with that. Um, let's see here. Material wise, um, it sounded like people were not happy with railroad ties. They don't think we should allow those. Um, they were a little more open to concrete um, and also think that the materials should really be based on the district and what is common to that area. For instance, we could be more lenient in like an industrial rhino area per se with Gabby on walls or concrete versus, you know, a different district. Um, and also it was mentioned how it's really hard to maintain the Denver Hills just to water it because they die easily. Um, and also it was mentioned that they think it's important that there be a bit of a setback between the sidewalks and the retaining walls or fences just to have a little bit of uh, landscape space there. And let me see what else. I, I think that's the gist. If anyone else wanted to add anything, Sue mentioned fences on top of retaining walls, but I'm not sure how much that jumps into the specifics of retaining walls. Yeah, something our group talked about as well. All right, who's next? I can uh, summarize for my group, which is um, group two. So my group basically had the um, opposite <laughs> Uh, reaction to the Denver Hill um, and felt that they are a unique feature to Denver and should be maintained when they are significant to the district. Um, there was discussion that uh, retaining walls sometimes end up being a do-it-yourself project um, and it's something that um, homeowners can do themselves, um, but they do significantly change the appearance of the district. And um, if we are going to allow retaining walls, it should only be in uh, certain circumstances, like there's damage to the sidewalk or there's flooding issues. Um, but my group was mostly in favor of keeping our current guidelines in place and felt that our guidelines were pretty straightforward as they're currently written and um, are a little bit clearer than some of our other guidelines. Um, we did briefly touch on the Denver Hill and issues with sustainability there. Um, but generally speaking, we felt that preserving the Denver Hill and not allowing retaining walls. Um, but if we do using durable materials and not timber ties and things like that would be most important. Great. Ozzy, I can uh, kind of go over what we want of what we went over in our group unless you would prefer. Okay, so Ozzy started the conversation off with an interesting question of why do we even re review retaining walls through Landmark? Um, why not just do it through zoning? And if it's not impacting the main uh, structure, then why are, why are we reviewing them? Um, which I thought was a good, an interesting question, good question to add in there. Um, it does appear that the consensus was that uh, flexibility um, should be allowed in districts and maybe a closer look on um, individual landmarks. It, they also did state that it depends um, from property to property. So there are some areas where the Denver Hill is quite steep um, and changing or putting in a retaining wall um, may have a, a bigger impact than on a, on a property with a, a smaller Denver Hill. So they kind of wanted us to look at it on a case by case basis. Um, they did talk about how terracing does help. Um, there was mention about how kind of terracing does help to maintain that overall appearance of the Denver Hill. Um, but allows people to more easily maintain the slope. <laughs> um, there were also uh, a kind of consensus that materials are very important. Um, uh, we had a, a person that had mentioned that um, the material should be deferential to the, um, for a, a retaining wall should be deferential to the architecture of the building. So maybe that leaves it open uh, vague enough that um, as new modern materials come available, the commission um, may have flexibility to see if those materials uh, fit within the context. Um, there was also kind of a strong uh, consensus that 
um, materials, modern materials could be used like the gabion uh, still or the, or excuse me, the gabion wall or the court and still in certain cases. Again, it depends from property to property, but not um, the crummy <laughs> um, uh, man-made block that you get at Home Depot, <laughs> maybe not an appropriate material here. Um, so uh, they also said uh, height would be uh, on a case-by-case -case basis as well. Again, kind of touching on different heights on Denver Hills or different changes in grade at the front of the property um, that would need to be in, in addressed from property to property. So that was basically in a nutshell um, what our group discussed. Ozzy, if I miss anything, feel free to chime in on it. I, I should clarify, I wasn't advocating for not regulating retaining walls at all. I just, I was having a hard enough time caring about them to just, you know, right. <laughs> Note taken, that's great. All right, who's next? I'm gonna ask Sandra to talk for group number one. Okay, um, so, uh, as far as materials, we talked about what looks good with the house um, and having it be something that's um, consistent with the, you know, the look of the house. Um, we talked about um, longevity of the materials and some debate about um, which materials have longevity. I think you probably have to look that up with the material you want to use. Um, the Denver Hill um, my point about the Denver Hill is that it really hasn't been around, um, that it has been flattened out for probably a hundred years before there were the um, guidelines um, from Landmark. And so it really shouldn't be um, revered. Um, however, we also had people who felt like if the majority of the block still had the hill, then maybe you should keep it. If the majority of the block still had retaining walls, maybe you keep that. Um, you certainly wouldn't want to penalize a person, um, you know, if the neighborhood was, if the block was 50-50, I don't know how you, how you work that out. But I just think that the idea that this Denver Hill so named as something sacred is um, uh, really a misnomer and not really consistent with the history of at least the East 7th Avenue historic district where probably half the houses are, have flattened out yards, particularly the oldest ones. Um, as far as um, uh, maintaining of that, you know, um, probably what the other group, you know, said, it's just difficult to maintain that um, looking good. Um, and, and I think the idea of having, um, you know, some greenery or some landscaping in front of the retaining walls really does soften the look and um, give the doggies all a place um, that they regularly live with their legs. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, and if anybody else wants to jump in, go ahead. All right, great. Who's next? I can go for group four. So, um, we had a, a comment that landscaping is sort of a modern complement to historic structures um, and that it, we acknowledge that it can be really difficult to recreate the large and the well set stones um, that are maybe more historic to the area. I think um, there were multiple comments that the context of the area is really important. It would impact the materials and the height and the visual impact. And we acknowledge that that honestly, um, like some of the other groups have said, may may vary block to block, um, in addition to neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, that uh, some of the um, retaining wall guidelines have been inconsistent, can't have been and could be inconsistently applied, um, and specifically as it relates to non-permanent versus permanent um, knee walls or um, retaining walls, and that ideally form would follow the function and that maybe a less prescriptive option um, saying that choosing materials that specifically relate to a contributing historic structure may be helpful. Um, and there was some preference for terrace retaining walls to replace, particularly to replace the existing damaged walls. Um, and like some other people have said, noting that the, the Denver Hill 
um, may actually not be sustainable or environmentally friendly. And in some cases, a retaining mall may actually contribute to the appearance of the neighborhood. Um, and then an additional equity consideration, um, it would be great if the requirements uh, wouldn't significantly impact the cost of replacing existing retaining walls that are in disrepair. So I think that I hope the other the group members would add anything if I missed anything. Thank you. Anyone else? I think we have a few more that haven't shared. Um, I'll, I'll report for group three. Um, again, the um, you know there was an appreciation for the Denver Hill where the hill uh, existed as a contributing feature in a particular neighborhood. Um, there was a comment that the top of the wall is as important as the materials on the face of the wall, which I think is something that um, the guidelines may not address as clearly as they could. Um, I, you know, a lot of the comments had to do with uh, the compatibility and context of individual blocks in individual neighborhoods so that you know, a certain amount of flexibility would be appropriate that what is um, uh, contextual and fits in, in on one block or in one neighborhood may be completely different in another block and another neighborhood. So that the, it seemed to me that the comments, a lot of the comments had to do with, with maintaining a consistent or compatible uh, context of what's done from one property to another. And I think that kind of covers it. Unless someone wants to add what I might have missed. Thanks. Kara? I was going to say, um, Patrick, do you mind going? Um, or if not, um, I think Kelly and I took notes as well. Uh, yeah, I can go for group six. Um, I think we were on the same page of deferring to the individual districts a bit, you know, with the, the focus being on the, whether it's the retaining walls or in general or terracing specifically that it fit within the the character of the district um, we actually had uh materials wise we had mixed opinions on the railroad ties we had some for given denver's uh historical context as a railroad town and then some against being that they don't tend to hold up that well um, a point that we discussed was kind of the uh, maybe more important than the specific material was the quality of the construction and that, you know, you could probably make a nice looking wall out of uh, the Home Depot blocks, but it'll last for about a week before it starts falling apart. And so that, you know, uh, a disrepaired retaining wall doesn't look nice no matter what you make it out of. That's quite a true statement. All right, uh, is there an, one more group or am I the last one? Okay, I think that's me. All right, so our group um, generally thought that terracing was better than a straight up wall. Um, there were there was discussion towards the end about whether um, whether you should put a, a fence on top of a wall, whether there should be a maximum height of the wall and fence combined. Um, the fence should be uh, transparent, so um, a metal fence with pickets as opposed to a solid fence um, to kind of enclose the the yard. There was also um, discussion about material and um, that some styles of concrete block are are better than others that are they look better and are um, are more compatible with the historic character of the districts than others. Um, but really, the material of the wall should be in based on the consideration of the design of the house and the materials that are used, and that also. Um, there should, if there's more uniformity on the block in terms of um, house and uh, yard, then maybe there should be more uniformity in terms of the retaining wall. And if there's less uniformity, then more flexibility should be allowed. So anything that I have missed on any of these? Any last words on retaining uh, walls? Yeah, Jennifer? Yeah. Uh, this is Paul. Uh, just one thing. <clears throat> Uh, about the terraced uh, retaining walls. And I'll just throw this out for thought. At some point, we might want to think about how do accessible ramps get incorporated at, to get 
to these historic houses. Uh, please stop at an age where I have to start thinking about that. So uh, I'll throw that out there as food for thought. Thanks. Yeah, that's a really good one. Thank you. Great. Anything else before we jump into wall cladding materials? And I do apologize. It looks like this meeting might go a little bit late. So um, we hope you can stay on, but if you need to leave, we totally understand. So. All right. Brittany, go ahead and take it away. Um, we're on the breakout slide. So now we're gonna talk about cladding materials. Uh, Denver is a brick city, and this is due to the great fire of 1863. Um, following the fire, laws were passed by Denver City Council prohibiting the use of flammable materials in building construction. Um, and because we had an abundance of clay in Denver, brick really became the primary building material in Denver. Uh, there are some stone houses and five main rocks were quarried within um, locally, and those are granite, sandstone, marble, travertine, and rhyolite. Um, you see a lot of those on the Cat Hill Mansion. And then finally, terracotta became really popular um, after the 1900s, and the Denver Terracotta Company was one of the largest producers in the, in the country. Um, so because of this character, um, our guidelines state to use uh, materials that appear similar in scale, color, and texture to those seen historically. Um, so generally that means brick, stone, or genuine stucco. Um, our guidelines say that architectural metals uh, may also be appropriate, particularly in commercial context. Um, but we also have a guideline that says you can use new materials as long as it has a similar appearance size and shape and finish that conveys a sense of authenticity. Um, we do have a guideline that specific, specifically states that if you're using fiber cement board, it cannot be detailed to resemble wood grain. So what did other cities do? Um, in terms of vinyl siding, most of the 22 cities that we looked at do not allow vinyl siding. However, it might be allowed in specific circumstance if it's new construction, it's not highly visible, and it's not altering a character defining feature of a building. In terms of faux wood grain, um, out of the 22 cities we researched, only one city allowed the use of faux wood grain, and that is the city of New Orleans after the commission reviewed that material. So it's pretty much the norm across the country not to use. Um, faux wood grain products because it doesn't have the historic appearance of historic materials. Another thing that um, we look at in Denver is the reveal of siding. And currently um, we require a four inch reveal for lap siding and a five inch exposure for, um, for shingle siding. Um, in other cities, siding reveal is not generally discussed, um, but if it is, it is generally within a range, like Plano, Texas allows four to seven inches, or like Breckenridge, it says it should match the original lab dimensions. So that's generally what other cities are talking about when they look at materials. So when we're considering materials, it's important to keep in mind if the building is an individual landmark, like the Zhang Mansion pictured here, if it's just a contributing structure to the district, like this middle picture here, which has a new addition on its rear, or if it's new construction, like this uh, uh, picture on the um, right of your screen, or if it's a non-contributing structure. So you wanna keep in mind um, where the materials are gonna be applied and what the building is and its significance to Denver. Um, in terms of materials, it's also important to keep in mind the visibility of materials. So if the material is gonna be on the front facade, it's gonna be very visible from the public right away. Um, however, it's on the rear of the structure, it may not be as visible, um, but that can change based on if the building is an interior block or corner property. 
Um, and then you'll also want to keep in mind uh, primary structures versus secondary structures. Um, so, you know, a primary structure is going to be a lot more visible than a secondary structure. Um, so first, I'd like to talk about brick because Denver is a brick city. Um, Red brick is the dominant brick color in Denver's oldest neighborhoods, but in the mid 20th century, buff brick, brown brick, and green brick became popular as well. Uh, today, brick can be manufactured in almost any color, ranging from white all the way to black. Um, a brick wall can also have different color blends to provide variety to the wall surfaces. Um, so mostly we do get a lot of red brick infill just because that is the dominant color, but we are seeing um, some new colors uh, pop up here and there on new, new construction. Um, in terms of brick, um, it can also vary in texture and finishes. So historic face brick in Denver is hard fired and individually pressed into molds, and this creates really clean lines. Uh, face brick generally requires little maintenance and sometimes can have a decorative glaze or finish. Uh, wire cut brick, which became popular more in the mid 20th century, is formed by slicing a brick um, size piece from a length of clay. And this actually creates a rougher texture that is noticeable on the surface of the brick when it's fired. Uh, today, you can get brick in all types of textures and finishes. A uh, brick um, that has become popular is tumbled edge bricks. So this is bricks with slightly round edges and corners. Um, and it has a soft face that you see here in this photograph. Uh, these bricks are specifically manufactured to look old and weathered, um, and tumble edge bricks are not something that we currently allow as we feel that it creates a false sense of history. Um, so something that's not talked about too often is mortar color. So as, um, as brick color became started coming to a range, mortar colors also started to come into a range. Um, you can get mortar colors that match the brick exactly or find mortar colors that provide significant visual contrast. Um, but historically, brick mortar is a soft gray reflecting the uh, natural colors of the material. Um, so, you know, colored mortar is not something that we see very often, but it can really change the appearance of a brick wall. So in Denver, uh, historic brick buildings are solid masonry construction, and they use several weiss of brick to create the walls, which are extremely thick. Uh, we don't require solid masonry construction today and do allow brick veneers. Um, however, you can get brick veneers in a variety of forms. So you can have a standard depth brick on frame construction, and this replicates traditional masonry construction and it has proven durability. There's also thin brick available, and this is just essentially brick tiles attached to the facade with grout, and they're very thin in profile, and this is not something that we allow as they do not have proven durability. And then finally, you can get a standard depth brick on a precast panel. Um, this is something you see more in a commercial context, um, but it is possible to do. Um, however, it does can create control joints along the facade. Um, these control joints are not visible from a distance, but when you are up close to the building, uh, you can really see those control joints. So this is just an example here showing um, where those control joints would be visible uh, using that uh, precast panel. So a secondary material um, that you see in Denver often is uh, Wood siding in Denver, you mostly are seeing patterned shingles, cedar shingles, and shakes. Um, these are used in limited applications and gable faces. Uh, they are a handful of um, wood clad buildings in Denver in their, our oldest historic districts, such as Curtis Park. Uh, but wood clad buildings are typically simple clapboards and do not have any decorative detailing on them. Um, pattern shingles and cedar shingles and shake are often applied horizontally. Uh, vertical wood cladding, such as board and batten and tongue and groove, is not historically found in Denver, but it is the material that is proposed um, often for additions and new construction within our districts. 
Um, wood cladding is very popular for secondary structures and additions as is a cost saving method um, and you, you know not requiring that brick construction. Um, we have allowed vertical siding and a case by case basis where it's not incredibly visible from the public right away. Um, but where there is visibility, we do limit the use of that currently. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, we do limit the exposure of wood siding to four inches for lap siding and five inches uh, for shingles. Um, so as I mentioned previously, we do have a guideline that uh, specifically states not to use fiber cement that is detailed to resemble wood grain. And we do require smooth finish siding. You can see the difference in that material here. Uh, the commission has strictly adhered to this guideline since the adoption of our current guidelines on August 8th, 2014. Um, so this is not something we currently allow, but we are wanting to know from you if we should um, allow greater flexibility for the wood grain material. So our final, um, one of our final materials is stucco, and this is a traditional cladding material in Denver, although it's not as popular as brick. It's found on Mediterranean Revival, Mission Revival, Spanish Revival buildings. Um, it's also found as an accent material in Craftsman uh, bungalows. So this um, material is used as a primary cladding material in districts where it occurs historically. Um, but just like lap siding, it is a popular cost saving material for secondary elevations and secondary structures where it does not historically occur. Um, so EFIS ha uh, has been in use in North America since the 1960s, but really took off in popularity in the 1970s. It's often called a synthetic stucco, but it is not. Um, it's essentially a lightweight synthetic wall clad system that includes foam plastic and a thin a waterproof exterior. Uh, EFIS is not a durable material and by the 1980s, water leakage issues started to develop with EFIS um, and we do not allow the use of EFIS within our historic districts. Another material is fiber cement panels. Um, this is a more modern cladding material and the commission has allowed it in very limited use as an accent material on new construction or where it won't be significantly visible from the public right away. Um, however, with cement panels, you do get control joints and often there are visible fasteners involved with those cement panels. So when you talk about um, stu stucco application, there are two types of application um, that can be used. A three coat system is a traditional stucco that is on a metal lath. And then it has a base coat and a finish coat. Um, a genuine three coat stucco system has proven durability and is the only type of stucco application we currently allow in our historic districts. Um, however, there is a two coat stucco system um, and this is a true synthetic stucco. It's not the same as EFIS, it is different, um, but it has a water resistive barrier, a metal lathe, and then a base coat with an acrylic top coat. Um, it is a little bit more flexible than a traditional three coat stucco, um, and it does require pop proper installation of the water resistive barrier to remain durable. Um, but this is not stucco application we currently allow, um, but it's not the same as EFIS, which it often gets lumped into with. So we're wondering if we should allow additional flexibility in terms of the stucco systems that we allow. And then finally, um, the last material I'd like to talk about is metal siding. Um, so metal siding is allowed by our design guidelines. Um, however, the commission really allows this in very limited uses in the residential context and where it cannot be seen from the public right away. So there are different types of metal siding. There's standing seam, metal panel, and corrugated metal panels. Um, so standing seam and corrugated metal are historic um, materials, but they're not something you saw often here in Denver in the residential context. Um, you can apply metal panels both horizontally and vertically. 
And then metal panels and uh, standing seam um, can come in all kinds of finishes. So you have mate finishes that you see here, you have the natural finish, and then there's also Corten steel, which is a natural weathered material. The commission does not allow the Corten steel material as it tends to um, uh, run and create runoff of that material. So those are the materials that um, are allowed by our design guidelines. And we do have a few questions to ask you about those materials and where we should um, allow flexibility and where we should maybe not allow materials. Okay, so sending everyone back into the breakout room. All right, well, welcome back everyone. And sorry, again, this meeting is going late, but we really are getting some great feedback from you all. So thank you very much for sticking it sticking it out um, and providing such great feedback. Um, any, anyone wanna jump in and summarize wall cladding materials? I guess I'll go again first. <laughs> um, so my group was very spirited in this discussion. Um, I will say I, we didn't get to necessarily every question, but I think the main uh, consensus or not, I don't even know if there was one. I think it was like half and half, 50-50. 50-50 uh, that most of them were against faux materials in general. So faux wood grain, thin brick, not acceptable, don't want it. Uh, and some people were kind of on the flip side of that. They're supportive of modern materials, don't see why we don't allow it. Um, and uh, Sue mentioned that there could be a like a different use of mortar color to differentiate things, but um, that was kind of our general consensus to keep it short. Great, anyone else? I'll jump in. Um, so Ozzy was making a point at the end and he got cut off. So I'll let him jump in um, after I've gone through kind of our list. We also did not get through all the questions. The general consensus was that uh, brick on new construction, uh, you could have a variety of colors uh, so long as it was not abrasive and compatible with the surrounding context. Uh, they were not um, in for tumbled brick. They felt that it was too jarring and too replicative. Um, there was a comment that our current design guidelines treatment of materials was generally good um, with just a few minor tweaks. Um, they agree thin brick is not appropriate. Um, uh, the Sorry, I'm having difficulty reading my notes. <laughs> um, there, there may be some flexibility for different materials um, on secondary structures that are less visible, uh, but generally speaking, they thought that thin brick was not necessarily appropriate. Um, faux, wood green, faux wood grain siding, again, they felt that it looked cheap and it was inappropriate. Um, there are some modern uh, new man-made materials with faux wood grain on them that are more subtle. Um, so, uh, and maybe look a little bit more like actual wood. Um, that may be something that we can look at in the future uh, as materials uh, improve or uh, manufacturing improves or changes for these materials. But generally speaking, they felt that wood grain was not appropriate. Um, they felt that vertical siding shouldn't be used on the primary structure unless it was historically there. They did think that some additions uh, could be clad in ver vertical siding as well as uh, secondary structures, um, so long as it was um, easily helped it be easily recognizable as modern construction and um, wasn't too in intrusive visually on the site. Uh, they felt that the four inch reveal should have additional flexibility um, as there are usually a variety of reveals in historic districts. So. Um, the vote was for um, flexibility there. And then, um, Ozzy, you had a comment that you were trying to make about fiber cement material on exteriors. Um, and I wanted to give you the opportunity to finish your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks. I, I think 10 minutes wasn't quite enough for this one. Um, uh, yeah, so this was just a personal opinion that I, I feel strongly that um, uh, kind of your most economical way to build to clad a building these days is with horizontal lap fiber cement siding. And so I know in, in our neighborhood, we see a lot of ADUs built that way. And we've seen a new primary structure that was entirely clad in the horizontal lap siding. And it doesn't fit at all. 
it, it's it's being used as a primary material where it would never be used as a primary material on a large building like that. So that, that's basically it. Good, good thoughts there, thank you. Who else would like to share? Well, I can share for my group. Uh, we, we have um, a lively discussion on how visibility is not quantified anywhere within our design guidelines. Um, and, you know, like when we talk about visibility, what does that mean specifically? And if there was some quantifiable definition in our guidelines. And I think this applies really, um, you know, not only to materials, but all the things that we do um, in terms of our review as our guidelines say that there are, there will be flexibility for things that are not as visible. Um, in terms of materials, uh, my group felt that flexibility should be allowed, um, particularly if it is not visible um, from the primary street. But again, what does that specifically mean? Um, if it's at the rear, my group felt that everyone should, uh, or there should be some allowance for homeowners to put their own stamp and personality on that addition um, in terms of uh, what is allowed if it's not visible. Um, there was also a suggestion that we are going to need to become more flexibility uh, for uh, new building materials and sustainable building materials. Um, in terms of wood grain, um, you know, our, my group felt that uh, we could appreciate why we wouldn't allow it on the front facade, but in where it's not visible again, why not allow it? Uh, there's a comment that there's a back order on the smooth siding, so that might be a problem that we um, see coming up. Uh, there was also recommendations that we um, be flexible on brick color, particularly for new construction. Um, we did struggle with the tumbled brick question, um, especially if it is just as durable as any other brick. Why is it not maybe something that we don't allow? But um, when, when Mike didn't mention, you know, going to Mendoza and getting some of that salvage brick that is available and out there already. Um, same with architectural metals, felt like they were okay as long as they're not visible. All right, good to know. So uh, reports are that our colleague Becca, um, whoever was in her room, her computer um, re did a reboot because of our city technology system has been doing that for the last two days. Um, so her, she can't report back because she's not in. Anyone from her group would like to share? <laughs> she said that she was gonna call on Pat Cash and then he, he's not participating either. <laughs> Everyone's Jennifer, clean. yeah, this is Graham, and uh, we must have been the cursed group because my phone battery also died. So I caught the first half of the conversation, um, but unfortunately not the second. Although I, I can report from the first half Sweet. Um, that you know brick again was discussed as a material that is so um, durable and timeless in ways, but can be applied both you know historically and contemporarily. Um, so brick was we had fans of brick for sure. Um, very much agreement, I think, on the fact that a wood texture is not something that uh, we feel should be, you know, introduced. Smooth, smooth siding and cladding materials was another good one. Um, and agreement with the other groups in general that a tumbled brick, um, while certain styles and handmade styles may have had some of that texture historically, uh, the artificial tumbled modern brick was not something that we felt was a, a good fit. So I would say general consensus with the the larger group. Um, and that's the partial report from group one. <laughs> if anyone has anything more to add, feel free. All right, any any other groups? Patrick, I don't know if you wanted to do anything for our group. If not, I took notes. Um, I was gonna say, you, Kara, have the kind of the rundown of all of our line items, so I'll defer to you. Yeah. So um, basically we just went through and I wrote down every type of material we talked about and said yes or no on basically um, any sort of addition, anything that wasn't the historic house. Um, so ours was pretty traditional, maintaining a lot of sort of the traditional materials, um, but again, very dependent on what is part of the historic character of the district, that Curtis Park is different from the Highlands, that's different from Baker. Um, so there was a lot of um, 
wanting to fit in with what is the character of the district, but pretty traditional materials, um, maybe some thin brick on places that weren't visible, but not necessarily on the facade. Um, and um, wood, faux wood grain was just like a non-starter in, in our discussion. Um, and that the four inch siding reveal, particularly in the districts that were represented um, was probably mainly appropriate. Um, and um, metal siding in some cases may be appropriate, particularly in places like um, Curtis Park. Okay, cool. Anyone else like to share? So I can add that generally our group felt similarly to Brittany's that um, additions and secondary structures that we talked about significantly more flexibility on additions and secondary structures, structures and in particular, um, in some cases, a strong contrast is better than a poor match. I said that in some cases, um, tumble brick may be appropriate, um, but that we felt like it was okay to keep the faux wood grain siding disallowed as there's not a significant cost difference between the two. Um, we did have a discussion about using vertical wood on the front face of a contributing structure. Um, and the conversation really just said that um, it could show a similar material, but a contrasting application versus um, finding a solution that still um, shows a non-historic appearance, but um, but uses a more his, uh, uh, historic, I guess, material. Um, and then some conversation about um, a little bit of discomfort allowing the landmark uh, allowing landmark to dictate durability versus appearance, particularly for secondary structures. Got it. Okay, great. Uh, I think I'm last uh, again. So um, our group said that materials should be traditional to a historic district, um, that faux wood grain was not appropriate anywhere because it doesn't look historic um, at all, that um, a forest exposure, however, is not correct, that, that exposures should have a variety, um, should match the existing and should be more flexible in terms of the variety. Um, there's also, there was discussion about the color of stucco and the color of brick, that it should be um, match the historic context and that both of those are important. Um, and glass as a cladding material may be appropriate. That was another one that was not discussed um, by uh, like a listed as a cladding material that may or may not be appropriate just putting it out there. Anything I missed? My group? Oh, yeah. Uh, I was just going to add in our group, I, I mentioned that vertical beadboard uh, you might find on a rear sleeping room. And then uh, um, someone also mentioned that it's quite often found as a soffit material. So uh, there is use for beadboard in uh, limited spaces. Yep. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks for bringing that up. All right. Well, thank you all for um, uh, for all of your feedback on that. Let's just jump in real fast um, and go through these because I know we're very late on this meeting. Appreciate you guys. Um, so a couple more things that we're going to be updating um, for our guidelines is uh, for phase one is fencing, um, talking specifically about horizontal fencing and placement of fencing on the site in relation to the architectural features. We're gonna clarify for some lighting um, because it's not as consistent or clear as we'd like it to be. We wanna clearly indicate that vinyl windows are not allowed in historic districts because that is the how it's been interpreted currently because it's not a historic material in the districts that we have. Um, we have a whole section on vegetation, but we do not review vegetation and we have no purview over it. So we wanna remove that from the guidelines. Um, we wanna clarify what's allowed for egress windows and what's not allowed. Um, again, window materials for new construction versus historic buildings, and then more flexibility about sheds based on the size and placement. Um, we don't necessarily want to, uh, there's some people have applied for sheds, but it's actually a garage, um, pre-built garage kind of thing. And we want to clarify what's a shed and what's not. Um, and then uh, my 
computer, there we go. So uh, next steps for phase one. So um, if you haven't, please sign up for our newsletter. Um, I uh, sent the list of people who were interested in signing up for the newsletter to our communications team, and they will add you to the, the next batch. Um, we also have an online survey that you can find if you go to denvergov.org slash landmark. Um, and the, the information about the design guideline update is on there, and it'll take you to the online survey. So that'll be up for what about a month? Does that sound about right? Um, yep. Okay. Um, in the winter and spring of 2022, we were gonna we will have um, public review drafts uh, a public review draft out for you all to review, and we'd love to get your feedback on that, based on tonight's conversation and the online survey. Um, and we'll have a discussion item with LPC. We'd love for you to provide written or verbal comments at the meeting, and um, ultimately, when it goes to a public hearing at LPC for adoption. Um, again, please feel free. If there's something that you didn't feel like you got your voice across tonight, please feel free to email us, um, call us, reach out to us about any of your feedback on any of this. Um, and now, you know, 25 minutes late, we can jump into questions. Um, if anyone has any specifically, you are welcome to ask them. And Evan was going to moderate that part. Uh, we have a couple of hand raises. Uh, Paul Cloyd, you still have your hand up. I don't know if you had another question. Uh, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Cool. Great. Um, we're going to go to Miles uh, Tangelin then. Yes. Um, this is just a question of what may happen in the future. So, Blueprint Denver says uh, multifamily housing will happen throughout the city. Um, have you, how will this affect the historic districts? Have you, have you thought about that? Yeah, so we're, um, that's a great question and it's not specific to our design guidelines, but we, um, we in general are supportive of multifamily housing in historic buildings. Um, a lot of historic homes, larger homes have been converted into multifamily for many years. Um, and so we are supportive of that. We are also supportive of accessory dwelling units in historic districts. Right now, not all of them have um, a zoning that allows it, but we are supportive of um, ADUs in historic districts because it, it allows greater density in our um, historic neighborhoods and also takes the pressure off of um, adding on to the existing house. Okay, so so duplexes, triplexes, uh, if they were to do an addition? Yeah, and we have, so there there have been some properties that um, are zoned for multifamily and um, there were, for example, a site in Curtis Park that was an empty lot. Uh, they built a front to back duplex and then an ADU in the back of that. Um, and so that adds three units to a site that was originally blank. Uh, next, we have Gertie Grant. Yeah, um, my question comment has nothing to do with what we've discussed tonight. It has to do with when people buy houses in historic districts, I think it would be really helpful if there was some kind of pamphlet or something that neighbors could give to them that explains some of the requirements, whether they are benefits or additional hoops, like you have to have a permit for windows, which you didn't have to have a permit for when you were not in a historic district. I think it would be really, really helpful because, and I realize it's probably going to be historic district specific, but I think if some genius who has lots of time to write a grant to somebody and get the grant money to do it because I know the money is not, the money is tight, but I think it would be really helpful rather than having those of us who live in a historic district having to rat on somebody who is putting in vinyl storm windows. Great feedback, yeah, thank you. Um, it, it's something that, you know, we would love to, we would love to provide a postcard to property owners who've just bought in a historic district, um, just to say, welcome to the neighborhood and welcome to your, your historic home. Um, but we have not had the staff capacity to do so. So it's, um, 
it is a desire of ours. So hopefully we will get to do so down the road. I know a few historic district um, or some registered neighborhood organizations have taken upon themselves as well to do that, to put together a how to, um, how to get a permit, how, what you need to know about living in a historic district. And that's really wonderful as well. And it's really the realtors that should be telling them before they even buy. Yes. Because they're like, oh, I'm going to knock this down. I mean, I even heard people say, oh, we're going to buy this. We're going to knock it down. I said, you can't knock that down. It's in a historic district. They're saying, oh, they let, you can get around that. No, you can't. <laughs> and maybe the challenge is the realtors who are handling the transaction. Because there are some realtors who take a totally hands-off approach to letting people know some of the um, challenges of the new house that they are buying. And it may oh, be it may be an issue even for um, historic Denver to take up in terms of legislation that maybe would mirror the special district requi disclosure requirements that um, were just passed for the additional fees at, if you move into a, a special district that these are requirements that should be disclosed pre-purchase of a home. So just um, there, the title work that happens when one purchases a new home, it should show up in the title work because um, the property has been uh, listed as a historic district or an individual landmark. Um, and we've heard that that doesn't always, that isn't always the case, but it should happen that way. Ah. And of course, now my lights really went out. So it must be totally time to go home. <laughs> I would I would add though that it's um, pre-purchase, right? Title title is is really I mean they've already gone all the way down the process, um, and then and then they have to make a decision on the day that they're signing over, you know, their however hundreds of thousands of dollars that that really in the in the um, disclosures. Um, when looking is more the issue. Yes, understood. I've got a quick question. So in rolling out this process, would you guys want to do anything different for your engagement or what are your concerns about when, when you're doing these changes um, about how to make them better or, or things you'd like to see? Um, I'm not, I was, I'm not able to know who that was who asked the question. I think it was Miles. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of engagement, um, oh. we okay. Um, we are uh, doing these community meetings um, for each phase. We are also going to be sending out information about public review drafts. We are also sending out information about when the LPC. Um, discussion item will happen or discussion items will happen. Um, and we're trying to get as much public input as possible regarding these design guideline updates so that that can inform what is actually in the update rather than us developing the design guidelines that we're updating and then asking you all if you think that that is an acceptable um, solution. But what do you what do you see as the greatest challenges? And if you could change this process, how would you do that? I um, I'm not sure I can answer that question. Um, I think the challenges that we have faced in the past are that the design guidelines were drafted and then sent out for comment, as opposed to getting community feedback first. And so that's why we are just changing this around so that we get community input first. I'd also suggest for next meeting, um, it might be helpful to have poll questions as well. Um, as you sort of, if you, for example, the mortar question or the, the grain faux wood grain mm -hmm. question um, to get sort of a quantitative answer in, in addition to the qualitative discussion. What are your pain points as far as staff goes, as far as the process from projects getting submitted to you? Is there something that would change in that that you guys would like to see different? Well, we're, do, we're working on updates to our um, our application materials to so that people, it's we get more complete applications right away so that applications can come through our process um, and go through. 
get reviewed in a more expedient way. So that's something that's outside of the design guideline update. Um, we're constantly working on process improvements internally um, as well, and things that have to go to the LPC for rulemaking will um, will definitely be um, part of a public process. Um, so <laughs> keep that in mind. You'll be seeing those come through as well. Can I also just jump in? I wanted to mention to everyone, like this is our community meeting, but we are taking comments this entire time. Like, yes, please email them to us. Please take our survey. We are going to collect all these and we are listening to you. And that's why we're doing this. So. Yeah. Are there any further questions? You have our email address, you have our phone number um, and our the website. If you're on Instagram, you're welcome to follow us on Instagram. Um, we're posting updates about this process there. Uh, but yeah, we'd love to have you um, provide as much feedback as, as you'd like to give and tell your friends and neighbors and colleagues who um, work in historic districts or live in historic districts to, um, to reach out to us about the guideline update because we do wanna get, get all of your feedback. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for staying so long. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. And goodbye. Thank you. Good night.